What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us, rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it. Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. I'd appreciate short and concise uh, questions and responses, as there's much interest as ever. And at question number one, I call CoCab Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its progress on cladding remediation. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robison. The safety of residents and homeowners is our absolute priority. The 27 buildings that were in the initial pilot programme have all started the single building assessment process. This is a comprehensive and technical assessment of fire risk and required actions. We've now expanded that pilot to 105 buildings and a regional breakdown of that list has been published. I've always been clear that if immediate action is needed to safeguard residents, then this government will not hesitate to take action. On the basis of advice from fire safety engineers, we have established a waking watch at two buildings as a precautionary measure to safeguard residents. Co-Cab Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary advise what discussions have taken place with developers whose responsibility it is to ensure their buildings are compliant with fire safety regulations? And can the Cabinet Secretary offer any reassurances to people living in the properties affected, including in my Glasgow Kelvin constituency, who are understandably concerned and frustrated? Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, on a general point, we been continuing to work with Homes for Scotland and some of the country's largest housing developers uh, to develop an accord uh, to address cladding issues with regards to Lansfield Quay in Glasgow in particular. A number of positive discussions between the Scottish Government and developers have taken place and I'm pleased to confirm that the developers have agreed to meet the costs of the waking watch currently in place at Lansfield Quay. I do appreciate that the residents want to quickly move to a situation where there's no longer a need for a waking watch and technical experts are working at pace to design a longer term solution at which the developers will then deliver. Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. I've been contacted by constituents who are currently unable to secure a remortgage um, because they live in these properties. Now, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, these individuals are complaining of a radio silence from government on this issue and a lack of urgency in leadership. What advice is being provided to individual households who are trying to remortgage who live in these 105 properties? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. So uh, let me just first of all say that communication is important and if Miles Briggs uh, wants to uh, give me more information uh, in writing about the circumstances, I will make sure that there's more regular communication because regular communication is important. Now, um, Miles Briggs talks specifically about lending uh, and we're pleased to hear that banks are willing to lend uh, on properties with 
dangerous cladding for the first time since the crisis started. Mortgage lending, as I'm sure Miles Briggs is aware, is a reserved matter, and we expect that this will therefore be extended to all nations of the UK. We're working with UK Finance to formalise a process that works for lenders as well as homeowners in Scotland. I'm happy, happy to keep him informed. Uh, I would, though, not recognise the characterisation around urgency and leadership. We are providing that in very difficult circumstances, and we want to provide assurance to homeowners that we're working at pace uh, with developers to get to a situation where the buildings that need to be remediated are done so at speed. Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The residents at a number of the buildings um, in, in Glasgow are seriously worried about the situation and they haven't seen the reports that have been made available to government yet. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out when those reports will be available so that the residents can have some safety of understanding of what the problem is? Cabinet Secretary. Well, look, I do appreciate the point that Pam Duncan Glancy uh, means about oh, it's a worrying time for residents. The Scottish Government wrote to all residents notifying them of the decision on the 31st of January, and the factor disseminated that letter to residents on the morning of the 1st of February. Uh, on the 6th of February, Scottish Government officials, together with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the firm providing the waking watch, held a briefing session for the residents' committee, and we've been working with Homes for Scotland uh, and the developers to really take forward some of the wider issues uh, with the development of an accord. Uh, so I, I hope that does provide Pam Duncan Glancy with a sense of some of the communication that we have had with residents. But obviously, if there's, if there's more we can do, then we will. Question number two, Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle homelessness in light of reports that the number of people classified as homeless has reached a record high. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robison. Our Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan is the right long-term strategy for preventing and tackling homelessness and is strongly supported by, the, by Scotland's homelessness sector. Uh, aligned with this plan, I have commissioned an expert group to bring forward innovative ways to reduce the number of households in temporary accommodation, and I am meeting with housing conveners to inform our approach. In the meantime, of course, we continue to lead the way on delivering affordable homes in the UK, having delivered 115,558 affordable homes since 2007, and have started work towards our target of delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032. Pam Gossel. 36 people have needlessly died while in temporary accommodation in six hotels across Glasgow. Campaigners argue that hotels are not equipped to support people in a crisis and so vulnerable individuals are missing out on access to potentially life-saving drug and alcohol treatment and mental health services. But as expected, the SNP government have no shame. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to a public inquiry and will she declare a housing emergency immediately and as these benches have repeatedly called for? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we will continue, first of all, with our massive investment of £3.5 billion of investment in affordable homes, something that is not replicated anywhere in these islands because we recognise that affordable housing is a key lever of tackling poverty. Now, Pam Gosso referred to a very difficult situation uh, with very vulnerable residents uh, within hotels in Glasgow, and I'm sure she will understand the complexity of some of the issues that are facing uh, uh, the, the people concerned. And any death in those circumstances is a tragedy, and she will also be aware, I hope, of all the work that's going on to try and make sure that people are supported, uh, because uh, whether it's addiction issues or issues with mental health, these are issues that require it to, to, to be addressed along with trying to get people into settled accommodation. And through our Housing First programme, uh, that is a programme that is working to support people with wrap around support. We will continue to work with Glasgow and any other Briefly, Minister, please. to make sure that we can support people in the way that they require. Question number three, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many payments of the Scottish Child Payment have been made in the Glasgow Annies Land constituency since it was introduced. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robison. 
Official statistics for Scottish child payment are routinely uh, published by Social Security Scotland, including application and payment data. And whilst these include information by local authority area, they do not currently include information by parliamentary constituency. The latest statistics published earlier this week show a total of 331,180 payments were made to clients living in the Glasgow City Local Authority between February 2021 and the end of December 2021. 2022. Scottish Child Payment, of course, is putting money into the pockets of low-income families at a crucial time, and more families than ever are eligible for support. Bill Kidd. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for that uh, response. Um, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has said that the full rollout of the Scottish Child Payment is a watershed moment for tackling poverty in Scotland, and that the rest of the UK should take note. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide further detail about the impact the SCP is projected to have on poverty levels in Scotland and what more could be achieved if the UK Government stepped up and matched this ambition? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we published analysis in March 2022 that suggests that Scottish child payment could reduce relative child poverty by an estimated five percentage points in 2023-24, lifting 50,000 children out of relative poverty in Scotland. The UK Government, of course, could use its powers to tackle child poverty and the cost of living crisis, introducing a £25 per week uh, uplift uh, for universal credit and means-tested legacy benefits and ending the benefit cap and two-child limit, just to name a few. Reversing key UK government welfare reforms that have occurred since 2015 could bring an estimated 70,000 people out of poverty in Scotland, including 30,000 children. That's something I think we would all want them to do. Question number four, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the Clyde Metro project will improve rail services on the existing Mogai line. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Whilst it is currently early in the process to advise exactly how Clyde Metro will impact on rail services in the Mulgai line, what I can say is that the Metro will complement and integrate with the region's existing rail and bus networks. The system may include wholly new track, the reuse of former rail routes or the conversion of existing lines. This will lead to more reliable public transport, increased travel choices to key employment opportunities, education and healthcare destinations and help to address inequalities. It will be truly transformational for Glasgow and the surrounding communities. Ross Greer. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that answer and I share her enthusiasm for the transformational Clyde Metro project. Despite recent improvements, the Mogai line continues to be one of the worst performing in Scotland, with regular delays, cancellations and issues with capacity all tied to the limitations of it being a single track line. Would the Minister agree with me that the only way to resolve these issues and achieve the Clyde Metro's ambition for frequent services on the Mogai line is to re the line and to build the long mooted Allender station? Minister. So for trains terminating at Mulgai, ScotRail have advised that performance is comparable to that of the Suburban West Service Group and indeed ScotRail as a whole. However, if there are issues with specific services, as the member has alluded to, I'm more than happy to raise those matters with ScotRail. I know they were in Parliament only yesterday for a drop-in session with MSPs. And with respect to the Metro, obviously it will be for the design development process to look at what impact, if any, that will have on rail. I'm, I'm sure it will have extended impact in relation to the delivery of services locally. But I would also note that work by the local council, Eastern Bartonshire, um, in their local transport strategy back in 2019 concluded that both a standalone rail station at Allender and in uh, combination with double tracking, as the member has alluded to, um, offered poor value for money. And instead, the council preferred a bus-based option to improve Briefly, access Minister. to existing rail services. But if the council have changed their view in the interim, then I'm happy to ask my officials in Transport Scotland to re-engage with them on this matter. Question number five, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the new medical centre for Loch Ely. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government's Capital Investment Group, CIG, considered the outline big business case for the Loch Ely Health Centre project at its meeting in June 22. In response to the feedback provided, the NHS Fife project team is currently updating the business case. We don't have a date for when the updated business case will be resubmitted to Scottish Government for approval. Annabel Ewing. I thank the Minister for her answer and she will know in, in preparation for this question session that on the 28th of October 2021, the Cabinet Secretary for Health gave me, and I quote, an absolute confirmation that when the business case for the new Loch Ely Medical Centre was in place, the funding would be found. So I would ask the Minister today, firstly, if she will make that uh, 
confirmation as well, she will provide that assurance to my constituents. And secondly, if she will advise my constituents in Loch Gelly when they may expect finally to get their new medical centre. Minister. So, uh, absolutely. I'm happy to provide that assurance. I recognise that the current health centre and much of the NHS estate needs replacement. That's why the Scottish Government is committed to investing £10 billion in health infrastructure over the next 10 years. That will include funding for a replacement health centre in Loch Gelly, and, uh, because we remain absolutely committed to that project. Our planning assumption is that the phasing of the funding is likely to be in the second half of the decade, and NHS 5 will align the update of the business case to that expected timeline. Question number six, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the 200 million Aberdeen to Central Belt uh, rail enhancement project, which aims to reduce travel times between Aberdeen and the Central Belt by 20 minutes by 2026. Minister Jenny Gilruth. The ministerial commitment to spend £200 million on enhancing the Aberdeen to Central Belt rail corridor was made alongside but not as part of the Aberdeen City Region deal for delivery within the same 10-year timescale. Some concerns were expressed at a relatively late stage by the Network Rail Operations team last year. Those concerns, which have since been resolved, have led to a delay in Network Rail formally signing off the option selection process. Nonetheless, good progress is now being made and the project remains on track. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, 16 years of the SNP in power and the people of the North East are still having to put up with a second class rail service. The new trains for the North East are 40 year old diesel 125 cast offs, no chance of electrification to Aberdeen, no chance of duelling at USAM, and I would suggest no chance of reducing journey times to the Central Belt by 20 minutes by 2026, something that the local Chamber of Commerce has said is vital to economic growth in the area. So, would the Minister agree with me? that rail services to Aberdeen and the North East are being neglected by this SNP government. Minister. No, I would not agree with Mr Lumsden's uh, characterisation of investment from this government in relation to the North East. May I remind the member that the Scottish Government is investing £379 million in the Aberdeen City Region deal compared to just £125 million from the UK oh. Government. Now, of course, Aberdeen and the North East have benefited from significant rail enhancements in recent years. That includes £330 million of investment to support the redoubling of the line to Inverurie, allowing a half-hourly service to Aberdeen and an hourly cross-rail service to Montrose. The opening of the new Contour station between between Inverurie and Dice stations in October of 2020, featuring the largest electric vehicle charging facility in the North East and backed by £15 million of investment from this government, and Aberdeen Station's refurbishment, which has been supported by over £8 million of Scottish Government support. In relation to the rail Briefly, Minister. Programs, I think it's worth reflecting that Network Rail, as I mentioned last year, did raise some concerns. That set progress back. Nonetheless, good progress is now being made, and I'm sure Mr Lumsden will welcome that progress. Yes. Julian Martin. I, I was going to say let's examine the facts about the, the investment that the Scottish Government has made, but Jenny Gilruth has actually just listed everything I was going to say. Contour Station, duelling the Aberdeen to Inverness line in time, completing the AWPR. Meanwhile, a Tory UK Government pulls the plug on £1 billion of carbon capture investment for Peterhead in 2015 and only contributes £125 million to the City Region deal, as opposed to the Scottish Government, which contributes Ms. Martin, do you have a question? My question is, would the, minister, would the Minister like to take this opportunity to further describe how the UK Tory government should be stepping up, stepping up for the people of the North East rather than letting them down? The Minister must, of course, answer the question in relation to matters for which the Scottish Government has general responsibility, and I would ask the Minister to do so briefly. I think uh, Ms Martin has succinctly outlined the record investment coming from this government to rail services in the north east of Scotland and to her constituency. Additionally, of course, since ScotRail came into public ownership, we have made significant investment of over £11 billion on rail infrastructure, including refurbishment of Glasgow Queen Street and Edinburgh Haymarket stations, and a billion pounds in the last 10 years to electrify over 400 kilometres of track. Question number seven, Graham Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to roll out mobility as a service across Scotland. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Mobility as a service provides people with better travel information, ticket booking and payment services so they can decide how to undertake their journey. The Scottish Government made a programme 
for Government commitment back in 2018 to establish a £2 million fund to support innovation, digital, data-driven solutions to test MAS in Scotland. Five projects were awarded funding covering the Highlands and Islands, Tayside and the South East of Scotland and will complete later this year. Graham Simpson. I thank the Minister for that answer and, and I welcome the uh, pilot projects but what we don't want to see is for them to suddenly stop. So can the Minister uh, assure us that funding will continue uh, and will we see the, the results of those pilots published? Minister. Uh, I thank Mr Simpson for his question. I very much recognise the value of the Scottish Government's investment in mobility as a service. Indeed, uh, last month I was in Inverness seeing for myself how that investment is being used to support the development of the Go High app. Last Thursday I was in Dundee visiting Dundee and Angus College to see the approach they've used in the local area, joining up transport providers for college students, NHS workers and even for use in Ochlobe National Park. Now, having invested that £2 million from the Scottish Government, Transport Scotland are now required to evaluate the outputs from the investment fund projects to assess the viability of the concept across Scotland. That evaluation will look at a number of different factors, but of course the projects are yet to complete, so I don't want to um, approach, uh, come, arrive at a view rather before those projects have completed, but I recognise Mr Simpson's uh, interest in this subject. I think it's a really important piece of work in relation to joining up transport across Scotland, and hopefully we'll be able to learn lessons from these investments from the Scottish Government. Question number eight, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards fulfilling its commitment to introduce a national system of rent controls by the end of 2025. Minister Patrick Harvey. Long-term rent control measures will be included in the forthcoming housing bill, which is expected to be introduced as soon as possible after the 2023 summer recess. This will enable the Scottish Government to meet our commitment to deliver rent control by 2025. Katie Clark. I'm grateful for that answer and I appreciate that there is litigation in relation to the rent cap and eviction ban but as the Minister knows the cost of living crisis continues so can he reassure tenants that the government remains committed to providing protection against unfair rent increases and to introducing the national system of rent controls? Minister. Yes, I can. The member's correct that we can't comment on, on current legal proceedings. However, the Scottish Government has led on housing over the long term, whether that's through the abolition of the right to buy investment in social housing, most recently the emergency rent freeze in the face of the cost of living crisis, and our long-term commitment to a national system of rent controls. And I know that many Labour colleagues share great enthusiasm for seeing us continue in that work. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions and at question number one I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, at midnight on Tuesday, businesses in Scotland were legally required to sign up to the SNP Greens deposit return scheme. Thousands of producers rightly decided not to because the scheme is an absolute shambles. Lorna Slater, the minister in charge, said just 664 businesses had registered, but refused six times in this chamber yesterday to say how many should have signed up. So will the First Minister give us that answer now? How many businesses should have signed up to her government's deposit return scheme? First Minister. Well, First of all, Presiding Officer, uh, when a big change is introduced, it's understandable there will be concerns about it. And I have deep respect for uh, the concerns that have been raised by business, and government will continue to work with uh, business to address those. But frankly, uh, the sheer opportunism of some opposition parties who have supported this scheme, rightly supported a deposit return scheme, previously criticised the government for taking too long to introduce it, to now indulge in knee-jerk opposition. The opportunism of that, presiding officer, frankly, is breathtaking. And so too, so too is the, and I'll use uh, a, a parliamentary term that I believe is polite enough, so too is the blatant distortion uh, of some opposition politicians. Uh, and yes, I am talking about Alistair Jack in particular. But coming back to the point, and this is a, an important point, uh, the number of companies in the drinks industry inevitably changes over time. Um, and at the outset of introducing this scheme, it was estimated that there were around 4,500 companies. 
However, significantly less than that will have to register because once groups of companies registering under one registration are identified, the estimated number of individual producers importers uh, will be below 2,000. But that's not actually the most relevant statistic. The most relevant statistic is the share of the market, the percentage of products that are included. That is over 90% are now included in this scheme. And finally, presiding officer, if I was to state that in the opposite way, if I was to stand here and say that 90% of producers uh, were registered, but that only covered around 20% of the market, that would yeah, be a problem, uh, because that would be a seriously problematic way of approaching this. So we will continue uh, to progress with Briefly, the scheme please. that is for the benefit out of, of our environment, and we will do that responsibly, because that's what people across Scotland have a right to expect. Douglas Ross. First Minister, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Surely you or your many, many officials watch Lord Through Slater the chair, please. absolutely unable to answer a basic question yesterday, but one that is so important. We need to know how many businesses, producers, the First Minister's government expected to sign up to a scheme when we know only 664 did by the deadline. It's a very simple number that either the First Minister knows and is refusing to tell this chamber, or the First Minister does not know. And I think this chamber deserves an answer. Uh, and also, the First Minister says she has deep respect for businesses across Scotland. Well, businesses are giving this government a very clear message, loud and clear. Their deposit return scheme is a complete disaster. The Scottish Wholesale Association said it could be a car crash. UK Hospitality Scotland say it is flawed. Innes and Gunn say it's unworkable. The Scottish Chamber of Commerce, last night, after listening to the Minister's statement, said business concerns have been completely ignored. Car crash, flawed, unworkable. The voice of businesses across Scotland ignored. So, First Minister, even at this late stage, will you finally, just once, listen to Scottish businesses and pause this scheme? First Minister. Of course, the last time... The last time uh, the government announced a delay to the scheme, uh, necessitated, of course, by the pandemic, uh, Conservatives were amongst the first to criticise the delay. That's what I mean uh, by sheer opportunism and knee-jerk opposition. Uh, but that's what we've come to expect from the Conservatives. So we'll continue to act responsibly. But coming back to the central point in Douglas Ross's uh, question, because it is important. Uh, and I did give him an answer in uh, my first response. Um, I gave him an answer in my first response, but I also pointed out that I think anybody looking at this rationally uh, would see is that it's the number of, of bottles, the, 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 the percentage of the product covered that matters most, because the vast majority of product is actually produced by a relatively small number of producers. And as of yesterday, uh, more than 90% of product, more than 90% of the share of the market is covered. And that is the crucial point. If it was the reverse, that would be a problem. So we will continue as we have done. Uh, there have already been a range of concerns that have been uh, responded to in terms of reducing the cost. So producer fees uh, are 8%, 30%, 40% lower than originally planned uh, for glass, plastic and metal uh, containers. The uh, day one payment for producers have been reduced and we will continue to liaise with business responsibly and sensibly. But let's not lose sight of the central point here, which is the purpose and the objective of this scheme. It's about reducing littering. It will reduce littering by a third. It will increase recycling rates of single-use drinks containers towards 90%. It will reduce CO2 emissions uh, by 4 million tonnes over 25 years. That's the equivalent to taking 83,000 cars off the road. This is about the environment. Uh, it used to be uh, the case that the Conservatives pretended to care about the Briefly, environment, please. but it seems those days are long gone. Yeah. Douglas Ross. Very clear, very clear, the First Minister is ignoring Scottish businesses again. But I'm sorry, when she says the opposition and calls to pause the scheme are sheer political opportunism, 
I'd hate to be the health secretary sat next to her. There's going to be some more finger wagging coming in a minute. Because, of course, we know that Hamza Youssef, Ash Regan and Kate Forbes have all said the deposit return scheme should be delayed. Political opportunism from the heart of the Scottish Government. Kate Forbes... Sake. We'll suspend business at the moment. Thank you. We will recommence and I will call Douglas Ross for his third question. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I have to say it's getting very tiresome, these constant interruptions uh, in First Minister's questions. We are here, democratically elected, to put questions to the First Minister. And when it gets disrupted like that, people watching and people who want to hear the questions and the answers uh, are getting pretty fed up by that childish behaviour. But I was kind of on a roll explaining the total, total political opportunism of the SNP. The total political opportunism of the SNP. We spoke about Hamza Youssef, we spoke about Ash Regan, now let's speak about Kate Forbes. Kate Forbes has said of the deposit return scheme that the First Minister has just defended over the last two questions could create economic carnage. Economic carnage. Now that's actually one of the more tame things that Kate Forbes has said about the SNP's record. But there's just one wee problem. Kate Forbes is the SNP's economy secretary. The SNP's record is Kate Forbes's record. When the SNP government were slow in paying out COVID grants to businesses, Kate Forbes was running the schemes. When companies demanded the SNP government reset their anti-business agenda, Kate Forbes was the minister who wasn't listening. And when the ferry scandal ran even further aground, Kate Forbes was fully on board. The new Kate Forbes seems to be saying the old Kate Forbes isn't up to the job. So can I ask the First Minister, which one does she agree with? The Kate Forbes with a terrible record in government or the Kate Forbes who says this government has a terrible record? First Minister. Uh, firstly, Presiding Officer, Douglas Ross. Douglas Ross said that he was on a roll. Um, I'm not sure whether he meant rolling down the hill, but that seems to be what that question... That question... I said last week. Thank you. We week. will. Excuse me, First Minister. Thank you. We will hear the First Minister. I said last week, Presiding Officer, that Douglas Ross uh, was seeming awful scared of Hamza Youssef. Uh, uh, it seems this week that he's also very scared of Kate Forbes, which says to me that whoever is standing here in my place in a few weeks' time. Uh, will keep the Conservatives firmly where they belong in opposition right. in Scottish politics. <laughs> Back to deposit return. Uh, this government um, and uh, I, for as long as I am First Minister, will continue to work to introduce sensible schemes uh, that protect the interests of business, but also protect our environment, uh, because we have a deep responsibility to do that. I would also point out again uh, that we are in no way unprecedented in introducing a deposit return scheme. Similar schemes are already operational in many countries and territories around the world. Indeed, some of uh, the companies, I understand, uh, that are raising concerns, as they have a right to do here in Scotland, are part of these schemes in other countries elsewhere around the world. And I read in the newspaper today 
the Conservative UK Government is about to announce its own scheme, perhaps oh. as soon as tomorrow, oh. uh, which no doubt will have Douglas Ross squirming, as he often does uh, when his colleagues in London make life difficult for him. So we will continue to be responsible, uh, liaising, engaging with business, but taking steps that are about protecting our environment and making sure that the cost of dealing with waste which of course has to be met, it is dealt with fairly. That's what this is all about. Douglas Ross. Presiding officer, can I begin uh, with an apology? It's been brought to my attention that I perhaps used industrial language in response to the protesters who interrupted the session uh, earlier. And to you, the Chamber, and everyone listening, including my mother probably, I apologise uh, for that. It certainly, I, I, I won't repeat it. Christine Graham's asking what I said, uh, I, and I promise uh, I won't repeat it. So I just do want to apologise uh, to you and the Chamber. But let's get back to where we were, because I was asking the First Minister. I was asking the First Minister about the leadership election and the SNP candidates, uh, and the First Minister doesn't seem to want to talk about that. And it's no wonder, because this contest is an absolute binfire. The SNP are so split and divided, they even tried to ban the media from watching the hustings. The only thing, the only thing that unites the candidates seeking to replace Nicola Sturgeon is independence. Yeah. And the candidates have even more reckless plans than Nicola Sturgeon's de facto referendum. Last night, Kate Forbes revealed that she wants to hold a referendum just three months after the next general election. Three months when there are so many bigger issues facing the country. Kate Forbes thinks that a deposit return scheme would cause economic carnage but holding another referendum to break up a 300-year union will be a breeze. Yeah. Yeah. Does the First Minister really think anybody in Scotland will find Kate Forbes' plans credible? First Minister. Well, I think what we found out in that uh, latest question from Douglas Ross is that his so-called role came to a crashing halt <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, can I also perhaps share some news with Douglas Ross, with the Chamber, and indeed the country, although I'm not sure it will come as any surprise to the country, the SNP is united in favouring Scottish independence. And I think, I think we're going to increasingly see the country united behind independence as the best way to free ourselves from the impact of Tory governments, or indeed from the impact of Labour governments that are often indistinguishable from Tory governments, uh, and be in charge of our own affairs and our own destiny, getting back into the European Union, for example. So I look forward very much uh, to the vigour of that uh, debate in years to come. Uh, and I'm also confident, presiding officer, uh, that whoever stands here in my place in just a few weeks' time uh, will continue the outstanding record of success of the SNP uh, and make sure thank you, that it's the SNP that continues to occupy these benches taking forward decisions for the good of people of Scotland, even when these are tough decisions, um, and that Douglas Ross and his colleagues uh, will stay certainly over there, but who knows, perhaps over there in years to come. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis that is hitting people hard, an NHS crisis that is pushing staff to breaking point and putting patients' lives at risk, and a wider economic crisis that is leading to business closures across Scotland, made worse by a flawed and chaotic deposit return scheme led by an incompetent government. And at the same time, the SNP has turned in on themselves, more interested in scoring political points against each other rather than focusing on the people's priorities. At this time of crisis, for business, for families and patients, why is it that all people in Scotland see is a government divided and in chaos? First Minister. I mean, presiding officer, I have to say, I mean, maybe somebody here can help me. I've, I've lost count of the number of leadership elections yeah. that have taken place in the Conservative and Labour parties yeah. in the years I've stood here uh, as First Minister. Uh, I think people in Scotland uh, will welcome seeing a robust debate about the future of our country, uh, covering all of the things that Anna Sarwar has just talked about. Um, and uh, they will appreciate uh, seeing candidates for leadership setting out proposals to build on the actions that this government has taken in recent years. 
Uh, Anna Sarwar talks about the cost of living crisis. One of the things that I am proudest of uh, in my time as First Minister and always will be proud of is the game-changing Scottish child payment, transformational for families and children across this country, doing more than anything across these islands to lift children out of poverty. I'm proud of that and I'm confident that whoever succeeds me as First Minister will continue with that record of success. Anna Sarwar. It'll be, it'll be interesting to hear if Nicola Sturgeon is proud of the candidates trashing a record in government over the last uh, couple of weeks, because the choice the people of Scotland are being offered by the SNP to replace Nicola Sturgeon is woeful. We have a health secretary who is closing an intensive care unit in air after promising to save it just a few weeks ago, a finance secretary who repeatedly blocked £15 an hour for care workers, who now miraculously is calling for it, and Ash Regan who thinks Scotland could set up a central bank within weeks. <laughs> Three candidates falling over each other to distance themselves from their own government's policies. All you turning on the flawed DRS scheme, all wanting to hit the brakes on a national care service, and all all over the place on independence. Now, Nicola Sturgeon gave all of these candidates their first step up in politics. So, I wonder, First Minister, with the benefit of hindsight, which one do you regret appointing the most? <laughs> First Minister. I'm proud of all of the governments I've led and I'm proud of those who have served in uh, these governments. And the record of, record of government, uh, I said on the day, presiding officer, I said on the day uh, that I announced that I would be stepping down as First Minister that nobody would entice me uh, into expressing a preference for my successor. And Anna Sarwar is not going to manage to do that either. Uh, but I am confident whoever succeeds me will continue with that record of success because ultimately of course uh, my record in government, uh, the record of uh, my ministerial team in government will not be judged by Anna Sarwar or Douglas Ross, it will be judged by the people of Scotland and actually in my time as First Minister it has Let's been judged hear the First Minister. by the people of Scotland on no fewer than eight occasions, eight landslide election victories. Um, I think that's the vote of confidence in my record as First Minister that I will continue you to be proud of. <laughs> Anna Sarwar. <laughs> Presenting officer, at the start of this contest, Nicola Sturgeon told us there would be a chance for Scotland to see the best talent the SNP has to offer. <laughs> so here we are, the top three. Ash Regan, backed by Alex Salmond. Kate Forbes, backed by Jacob Rees-Mogg. <laughs> and the Scottish Greens candidate, Hamza Youssef, backed by Peter Morell. <laughs> Now, it may be funny, but actually this is really serious because we have 770,000 people on an NHS waiting list. We have families struggling to put food on the table and pay their bills and businesses are shutting down because of this government's incompetence and anti-business agenda. At this time of national crisis, when people need a competent government that is on their side, is this really the best the SNP has to offer? First Minister. I think if I was, uh, and I know it's quite hard for me to imagine this, but if I was in the shoes of Anna Sarwar uh, or, or Douglas Ross, what I'd be uh, more worried about than whatever was happening in the SNP leadership election campaign was why it is that the only political game in town remains the SNP yeah. and they are lagging so yeah. far behind yeah. after 16 years of an SNP government. That says the people of Scotland continue to put their trust in us. And why do they do that? Take, take Employment in Scotland at the highest uh, level, I think, on record. Unemployment at the lowest yep. uh, level. We're seeing in a very, very challenging time for a National Health Service an increase in the number of patients being treated, the longest waits falling. Uh, we are seeing a, a situation which I hear Christine Graham say, no strikes in our National Health Service, which makes us the only nation in the UK to have achieved that. We continue to be the best performing part of the UK outside of London when it comes to attracting inward investment yeah. into our country. We're lifting more children out of poverty than any other part of the UK. That is why the Scottish people continue to trust the SNP and government. That is true today and I believe whoever succeeds me as First Minister, that is going to continue to be true for a long, long time to come as we continue and complete the journey to Scotland becoming an independent country. Question number three, Alex Paul Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. 
Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. Presiding officer, St Andrews Wine Company champions small and local producers. Their mission is to offer interesting and lesser known brands to their customers. Their owner, Peter, estimates that because so few producers have signed up to the DRS scheme, that three quarters of his stock will become unavailable. All they will have left is what you can buy in a supermarket. This is a family run business thrown under the bus, and there are thousands more businesses like them. Jobs are on the line, and this this is starting to cause real harm. Indeed, Fergus Ewing, a loyalist of 50 years, has called it willful recklessness. Her finance secretary, Kate Forbes, has called it economic carnage. Government incompetence is undermining the very case for DRS, something that could massively reduce our waste and emissions, but only if it works. Presiding officer, this is a moment of real jeopardy. It can't wait for the next First Minister because irreversible business decisions are being made right now. Nicola Sturgeon calls it opportunism. I call it scrutiny backed up by an avalanche of industrial concerns. So can I ask if the First Minister can halt the chaos of the National Care Service, why can't she pause this? First Minister. Well, firstly, we're not... Uh halting uh, progress to a national care service, uh, what we are doing is taking time to uh, both receive the report, well, receive the report uh, from the lead committee of this parliament and then take time to consider that report. If we did anything else, uh, then Alex Cole Hamilton and others uh, would be the first to, uh, and rightly, criticise us for that. Uh, look, as First Minister, I will continue uh, to take all of my responsibilities very seriously for as long as I am in this job. Um, and one of those responsibilities is to continue uh, to ensure that my government continues to engage uh, with businesses about concerns they have about the deposit return scheme or anything else and to address uh, those concerns and allay uh, fears that businesses such as the one cited by Alex Cole Hamilton uh, has put forward. Uh, and we will do that responsibly and we will do that in a way that ensures that we can introduce a scheme that is necessary and beneficial to our environment in a way that many other countries have already done, in a way that the UK government is about to do as well. Uh, and do that sensibly and responsibly. I think that's what people uh, do expect from their government on tough issues uh, as well as uh, on less tough issues. And that's the approach I have always brought to being First Minister and I will continue to do so. Question number four, Karen Adam. Ms Adam, um, we cannot hear you currently. Can you hear me now? Apologies. We can. Thank you. The host has unmuted me. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the Scottish Government's response to ongoing food shortages currently affecting Scotland. First Minister. Uh, we engage regularly with all of the main retailers. Uh, we are aware that some are currently experiencing temporary disruption to certain off-season fresh vegetables. Uh, some retailers have introduced a buying limit as a short-term preventative measure to avoid bulk buying and ensure that customers can get what they need. Retailers have provided assurances that there's currently enough stock available for customers uh, if everyone continues to shop responsibly uh, and that the situation is expected to improve week on week. And of course, we're monitoring this closely. Uh, given the pressure on food and drink supply chains caused by COVID, Brexit and the war in Ukraine, the Rural Affairs Secretary wrote to the UK Government last year to raise the cumulative impacts of labour and skills shortages and rising costs. No response was received to that and so the Cabinet Secretary has written again as recent events have clearly highlighted the vulnerability and the importance of supply chains. Karen Adam. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Former Chief Executive at Sainsbury's Justin King said, I hate to say it, but it's a sector that's been hurt horribly by Brexit. And Liz Webster, Chair of Save British Farming, said, the reason that we have food shortages in Britain is that we don't, and we don't have food shortages in Spain or anywhere else in the European Union is because of Brexit. The views from industry are clear. The shortage of basic nutritional necessities can be attributable to deliberate act of Tory policy. Does the First Minister share my utter dismay that the Tories refuse to acknowledge and apologise for the fundamental harms they have visited on people. First Minister. Karen Adam is 
absolutely uh, right here, uh, and the voices that she has uh, quoted, I think, underline that. Um, the food and drink sector in Scotland, and indeed across the whole of the UK, has borne the brunt, not just of Brexit, but of the very hard Brexit pursued by the UK Government, particularly through the, the loss of free trade and free movement. Although it is the case that poor harvest conditions in Spain and Morocco it is a key factor here in terms of some shortages, the situation isn't helped by the UK Government's approach to Brexit, uh, where our food and drink sector has lost many of the benefits they had when trading with the EU. The loss of free trade has increased, for example, the additional paperwork required to import to the UK and thus increased the cost of trade. And anybody who denies that, I frankly don't think is living in the real world. Brexit was uh, a mistake and the way it has been pursued by this UK government has compounded that error and it is of course one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why the sooner Scotland is independent, able to rejoin the European Union, the better it will be for everyone. <laughs> Question number five, Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on what discussions she has had with the Cabinet Secretary for education and skills in relation to bullying and harassment in schools. First Minister. Well, I am very clear, and I am sure this is a view shared by everyone across this chamber, that bullying and harassment uh, anywhere, but uh, particularly in schools, is completely unacceptable. And uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and I are committed to further work to help address this. Uh, just last week, Education Scotland published a thematic inspection report that we commissioned on the recording and monitoring of bullying in schools. We have since announced and commenced a review of the National Anti-Bullying Guidance. Respect Me, uh, Scotland's anti-bullying service uh, is part of that work, and we've invited teachers, parents and young people's representatives to be involved in it as well. Uh, later this month uh, we're seeking the advice of the teachers panel and the advisory group on relationships and behaviour in schools to further inform our approach. Pam Gossel. Thank you, President Officer. A pupil in my region has been subject to repeated instances of bullying and violence, sometimes even involving weapons. The parents have complained to the school, to the police, to the council and even the ombudsman, and now they are running out of options. On further investigation, the parent was appalled to find out that incidents of bullying had not been recorded, and, and an FOI request shows that this under-recording of bullying is a common place yeah. in our schools. Yeah. This neglectful SNP government is throwing pupils to the wolves. Does the First Minister acknowledge that under-reporting of bullying incidents in schools is an issue? And will she action the desperate pleas from parents and pupils by implementing an enforcement mechanism to ensure schools are accurately reporting yeah. incidents? First Minister. Um, firstly, it is important uh, that instances of bullying are recorded uh, properly, comprehensively and monitored. That's why, as I said in my initial answer, we commissioned uh, a report uh, on the recording and monitoring of bullying in schools and Education Scotland uh, published that report, the result of the thematic inspection that they did uh, just last week. So that is an important point, but one, as I've said, uh, that action is being taken to address. Secondly, I think it is really important, uh, and obviously I, I can't comment on individual cases, but uh, the experience recounted uh, by the member is unacceptable. Um, but it will also be the case uh, that that will be repeated many times over in schools across the country. Bullying is unacceptable wherever it occurs, but we're talking here about schools and given uh, young people, it is particularly unacceptable in schools. We should have a zero tolerance to it. Uh, I think all of us uh, would accept that it's not a new issue in our schools. However, uh, the modern world, particularly the role of social media in the modern world, means that bullying often takes uh, different forms and very pernicious forms today compared to some years ago. So the Scottish Government will continue to work closely with local government, recognising the lead responsibility here of government. Uh, but we all have a responsibility. As the, the Daily Record campaign uh, is very clear about, and I applaud its campaign, uh, there's a role for social media companies, and frankly there's a role for all of us as adults in our own communities to make sure uh, that children and young people are safeguarded uh, and respected. So this is a serious issue, and one that I want to assure the Chamber and the country that the Scottish Government takes extremely seriously. Rhoda Grant. I thank the presiding officer. Schools don't take responsibility to, 
for what happens to young people on their journeys to and from school. So can I ask the First Minister what steps she will take to make sure children are protected at this time and what steps the police are taking because those incidents are videoed from before the start of the attack so it's obviously pre-planned to track down those videos and hold everyone responsible to account. First Minister. So I, I, I think Rhoda Grant is, is right and actually it gets to the heart what, of what is a societal problem and therefore has to be addressed uh, uh, on a societal basis. Uh, obviously we're focusing a lot rightly on what happens in schools uh, and it's, it's important that we do, that local government and individual schools focus on that. But of course schools uh, can't be responsible, certainly not solely responsible for what happens outside schools. Uh, the police of course have a key role to play and I know they take that role very seriously and as I said uh, in my last answer, all of us as adults in communities have a responsibility and a role uh, to play to make sure that children are properly cared for uh, and, and safeguarded. So it is a, a, in some ways a complex problem, uh, but we shouldn't allow that to take us away from uh, the collective responsibility we have to tackle it. Government, national and local has to be in the lead in this, but we all have a, a part to play and I, I am sure all of us take that seriously. Willie Rennie. Uh, the First Minister knows that I've got deep concerns about the increase in violence in schools. It's always been there, but it's certainly increased since the pandemic. There's a lot of distressed behaviour uh, in schools. But teachers report that they are sick fed up with having to be left to pick up the pieces of this. They don't think there's sufficient resources to be able to manage it. So as part of the reviews that the First Minister has set out, will additional resources be available for schools to help them cope with this crisis? First Minister. Um, can, can I... Uh, pay tribute to Willie Rennie actually for the work he's done on this. I think it had been uh, very good and very important and uh, I'll give him a commitment that yes that will be part of the consideration. I know that's something the, the Daily Record has drawn attention to in terms of uh, funding to make sure uh, that there are places for young people to go but I know Willie Rennie is particularly talking about resources in schools. Uh, teachers are often at the front line of this particularly when bullying is happening in schools and we must take account of that. But that shouldn't take away from the fact that this is uh, not just an issue about what happens in our schools, it's a wider issue about how young people are, uh, I suppose, coping with the pressures of modern life, particularly over the last few years, um, and mental health support, another issue Willie Rennie has raised often in this chamber, is an important part of it. But making sure that those who work most closely with young people, and that obviously includes teachers, have the right support and resources to do that job is an important part of it. And I'll have further discussions with the Education Secretary over uh, my remaining uh, few weeks in this post about exactly that issue. Question number six, Hoysel Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister uh, what action the Scottish Government is taking in light of reports that individuals are unable to be discharged from hospital due to lack of available spaces in care homes. First Minister. We have provided an additional £8 million to health and social care partnerships to secure provision of 300 extra interim care home beds so that places uh, can be purchased above the national care home contract rate. Uh, this has resulted so far in 331 people uh, being able to be discharged from hospitals to these placements with a total of 581 people currently benefiting from an interim care placement. As part of the work of our ministerial advisory group in health and social care pressures, we are supporting local systems gain a better understanding of care homes data uh, and supporting partnerships to understand local availability and suitability of care home places for people in their care. Our plans for a national care service, which which I alluded to earlier on, of course represent the biggest public sector reform in Scotland since this Parliament was established eh, and will eh, help ensure consistency and fairness at a national level with services being designed and delivered locally. Faisal Chowdhury. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, last week, the Scottish Government issued uh, refreshed guidance on hospital discharge to care homes. The policy states that where the preferred choices of care homes is not immediately available, the person will be required to make a temporary move to another home with a suitable vacancy to wait. My constituent, John Finlay, has progressed his MS. He has been in hospital for seven months and is desperate to get out and into a suitable care home. John is 50 years, 58 years old. Many care homes will not admit people of that age. Therefore, the pool of places he can go to is significantly reduced. This new guidance 
could see him forced into accepting a place in a home that is either very far away from his community and support network or a home with a very poor track record of care. Well, the First Minister tell us how this is putting patients at the centre and why people like John have their rights denied to them because of the Scottish Government's failure to deal with the social care. First Minister. I think Faisal Choudhury raises an important issue and I, I, I am happy to respond in more detail if he wants to send me the, the details of the individual case, um, but what I'm about to say has general applicability. Firstly, uh, no one's rights should be denied and no one should be forced into a place that is inappropriate for their needs. What the guidance is seeking to do is firstly recognise uh, that for any patient that is a, a delayed discharge, hospital is not the best place for yeah. them. So being in another setting is better for them. And while obviously uh, partnerships uh, want to meet preferences, uh, they also need to consider uh, what is the best place relative to a hospital for somebody to be. But individual preferences um, are important. And of course, the case that has been raised here is not just about preference, it's about need given the, the condition. And that goes to another point, uh, and I uh, referred to work uh, that is underway to gain a better understanding of care homes data, because this is not just about the total number of places available, it's the type of care that individual care homes uh, are offering. So uh, these are complex issues, but they are important issues. And as we continue to reform health and social care, better integrate it, make sure that people get the care they need in the best place, uh, these are the issues uh, that we need to continue to grapple with to get to the right outcome. So that's a, a general response. I am happy to amplify some of that in relation to John, I think uh, your constituent's name was, uh, individual case uh, to hopefully give some reassurance um, about the matters raised. Thank you. We move to constituency and general supplementaries. I call Emma Roddick. Thank you, President Officer. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the Food Bank Network, the Trussell Trust, have stated that inadequate benefits were the main reason for a sharp increase in destitution and food bank use in recent months. Research has reportedly revealed that basic benefits given to low-income households are at least £140 a month below the real cost of food, energy and everyday items. Does the First Minister share my view that history will record with shame how the Tories' inaction and indifference has caused people in one of the richest countries in the world to face this dire standard of living? First Minister. Yes, I, I, I do agree very much with Emma Roddick. I, I think the Conservatives should be uh, deeply ashamed of the impact of their welfare policies. Uh, I think we've known for a long time that the current UK government benefit system is not fit for purpose uh, and people across the country are paying the price of that in, in ways that Emma Roddick has pointed out uh, every single day. Uh, we've called for improvements over many years. Uh, for example, uh, we should see an immediate uplift to universal credit and other means-tested benefits. Uh, we should see the scrapping of the unjust and, and cruel uh, two-child limit and benefit cap. Uh, and these two policies alone were singled out in a recent report from the Commissioner for Human Rights at the Council of Europe. Uh, it said that these policies continue to exacerbate child poverty. For our part, we will continue to seek to do the right things through our social security system, in particular with the Scottish Child Payment, which is lifting children out of poverty at exactly the same time uh, as the policies of the UK Government are pushing them deeper into poverty. And the last point I would make is if we were able to join up all these approaches uh, and have also social security powers under the ambit of this Parliament, we could do so much more for those who need our help most. Russell Finlay. Uh, thank you. A year ago I asked about dozens of registered sex offenders being allowed to change their names. It turns out it was not dozens, it is hundreds of sex offenders who are hiding their identities. Uh, people have no idea if the person next door may be a dangerous predator. So will Nicola Sturgeon agree that this is wrong and outline what her government intends to do about it? First Minister. Uh, we have, uh, I, I'm happy to write uh, to the member, or ask the Justice Secretary to write to the member uh, to again uh, give the detail of the arrangements in place. We have well established arrangements, not least the MAPA uh, system, uh, to ensure uh, that the public uh, have protections uh, from registered sex offenders. In terms of changing names, there are uh, requirements on people who change their name to, to give notification uh, of that. So this is not about people being able to hide. Uh, but of course, I will happily uh, remind uh, the member of these arrangements uh, in a letter that I will arrange to have written to him. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. 
Uh, this week, the legal age of marriage in England and Wales has increased to 18. The rise is to prevent vulnerable children and young people being forced into marriage. While Scotland retains the legal age of marriage at 16, can I ask what evaluation the Scottish Government has made of the appropriateness of 16 in light of concerns over forced marriage and coercion? And does the First Minister agree with comments this week from Dr Marcia Scott of Scottish Women's Aid that marriage under 18 is a mechanism for abuse in the worst case scenarios? First Minister. Um, I have not seen Marcia Scott's uh, comments, those particular comments, but I have a huge respect for Dr Marcia Scott, so I would always pay very close attention to anything she said. Uh, we are, of course, aware of the change of law in England and will continue to consider uh, the implications for and the, the case for change here in Scotland, and uh, the relevant uh, minister will keep Parliament updated as those considerations progress. Paul McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. Households across Scotland are continuing to face an incredibly challenging time at the moment and will be rightly baffled as to why their energy bills are set to go up despite energy prices falling. Does the First Minister agree with me that the Tory UK Government must now pass on the reduction in wholesale gas prices to consumers and bring down Westminster's cap and bills to £2,000 per year and devolve energy regulation powers to this Parliament? First Minister. I'm, I'm sort of bemused. Presiding officer, the Conservatives seem to think it's not appropriate for this Parliament to consider issues of the energy costs that people across Scotland are having to pay right now. I think it's exactly the kind of issue uh, that we should be discussing, and Paul McLennan is right to raise it. The new price cap strengthens uh, the case for the UK Government to reverse its plan to increase uh, the guarantee for an average household uh, from April. We result that such an increase would result in there being around 980,000 fuel poor households in Scotland. Uh, a significant increase uh, compared to estimates uh, for this winter with the price cap set at £2,500. So we've called upon the UK Government to provide additional support and we will continue to do so uh, because people need that support and they need it now. Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the results from the controversial school sex survey were released. The total participation rate from children and young people was 58.3% in the local authorities which took part. Out of those eligible to answer the questions relating to sexual activity, only a tiny fraction of school pupils answered. The data proves what I and others have said all along, that our children and young people do not feel comfortable answering these types of invasive questions. So will the First Minister finally agree with me that these inappropriate questions should be removed from all future health and wellbeing surveys in our schools? First Minister. Well, I think these surveys are really important. We've just had uh, exchanges in this chamber about the need uh, to record and monitor instances of bullying. And because the, uh, in my view, manufactured controversy around this survey led to some local authorities pulling out of it, we actually didn't get as much information on bullying uh, as we might have wanted to during this survey. We all need to be responsible about making sure we're gathering information about the Thank real you. life experiences of young people that allow local authorities, schools, national government to take decisions that is about protecting their welfare and well-being. Um, and I think it is really important to do that and to do that in a way uh, that avoids any temptation to get dragged into another conservative culture war, frankly. And the member, the member talks about controversial questions. You know, questions of this nature, and they relate to smoking, alcohol, substance use, and yes, sexual health, these have been included in health and wellbeing surveys for years. It's only recently that they have become politicised. Um, and lastly, presiding officer, questions about sexual health are asked in the equivalent surveys in England as well, where in case the member hasn't noticed it, the SNP isn't in government, another party is. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. People affected by historic forced adoption have been campaigning for recognition, support and for a formal apology for a very long time and they have support from MSPs in every party in this chamber. Having heard their calls, can the First Minister advise whether she is considering making a formal apology and if so, when? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Monica Lennon for raising uh, this issue. I've commented on this before uh, in the Chamber. I have expressed my uh, huge sympathy uh, with calls for a formal apology. I have also uh, 
rightly uh, talked about the, the, the complexities, the legal complexities that government has to work through. We are actively considering a conclusion uh, of that work right now. Um, and while, of course, uh, these are matters for the Business Bureau uh, to timetable, um, I am very hopeful of being able to uh, give uh, an indication of the outcome of that work uh, while I am still First Minister. Mark Croskill. Thank you. Um, I'm sure the First Minister will join me in offering this Parliament sincere condolences to the family and friends of all those impacted by the tragic fire at the Shaw Recycling Centre, Perth, early on Tuesday morning. This devastating incident is deeply concerning, not least because this is the second fire in six months at the site. In the days to come, our emergency services will be attempting to establish the facts of the situation. But does the First Minister agree with me that following this, there must be an investigation into the circumstances of the fire to ensure that such a tragedy does not happen again? First Minister. Uh, well, can I take the opportunity to extend uh, my deepest sympathies to the family of the uh, individual who sadly passed away following the fire at Shore Recycling Plant in Perth? Uh, early on 28th February, uh, the Fire and Rescue Service were alerted to reports of a large fire within the plant. They mobilised six fire appliances and specialist resources to tackle the fire, uh, which involved approximately 200 tonnes of scrap material. Uh, and they worked alongside partners to maintain safety both on and off the site. The last appliance uh, left at 9pm last night, and the fire service will return for a routine check today. Let me put on record uh, my gratitude uh, to uh, our fire service and all who worked at uh, the scene of this fire. Uh, the fire service uh, confirmed previous incidents resulted in the review of on-site fire safety measures. Uh, they initiated a joint investigation with the Crown Office and Police Scotland. Um, it would be inappropriate uh, for me to comment further, of course, until investigations conclude, but it is important uh, that investigations do take place. And Stephen Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Today is World Book Day. And the First Minister is, a well, is well known as a self-identified avid reader. So as she leaves office, how does she feel about being responsible for closing more public libraries than any of her predecessors? First Minister. That's not... I'm, I'm proud of the support this government uh, gives to libraries. Um, I saw many libraries in my... Uh, own constituency, as was the case across the country, have to close during the pandemic, but I've also uh, watched them reopen and become vital parts of local communities. So I'll continue to support libraries, I'll continue uh, to support everything associated with the wonderful world of books, and uh, perhaps I even look forward to having a bit more time to read them in future. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I seek your guidance. Yesterday, Lorna Slater said there were two billion containers in the deposit return scheme, representing 95% of volume. Circularity Scotland, the scheme administrator, say there are three billion containers. If the two billion figure is correct, then are BIFA being paid to collect one billion containers that don't exist? If the three billion figure is correct, then the volume registered wouldn't even be close to 95%. Presiding officer, would you be willing to invite Lorna Slater to correct the official record or come to the chamber to explain where the missing one billion containers have gone? In response to Mr Golden, I would say that generally the content of members' contributions are a matter for them. However, um, I do, of course, expect that, that ministers, that all members strive to, well, that ministers strive to respond to the specific detail of questions wherever possible. And it certainly is the case that a mechanism exists whereby members, where they become aware of an inaccuracy in any comment, can correct the official report in that regard. We now move on to members' business, and there will be a brief pause to allow members to leave the chamber and those in the public gallery who wish to do so. What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes. 
These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us, rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it.